Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. This week's episode is brought to us by our Amazon affiliate link. It's pretty simple how it works. Just head over to wedgesidepodcast.com, click through the Amazon link, and anything that you buy through that, we get a little kickback for. So if you're already planning on buying things on Amazon, which you're you are, let's just face it, you know, I I buy things. I, yeah, I, mean, I buy things too. Just use our link. We get a little kickback. Doesn't cost you anything more. So we get a little, they get a little less. It's exactly how it works. Trademark. <laughs> Trademark. TM. So just head over to whichsidepodcast.com and click on our Amazon affiliate link. If you're looking for something to get, check out Vegan Food Gifts. It's more than 100 inspired recipes for homemade baked goods, preserves, and other edible gifts that everyone will love. This is episode 144. Yeah, we talked to Ryan Pate of Tofu Magazine. Yeah, head on over to ilovetofu.ca. Because they're Canadian. But you can, Canadian. Get it, you can get it anywhere. It's an amazing publication. You, you just pay to download it on there. $5 suggested download. It's awesome. I love the stories they have in there. Um, they interview a couple uh, young vegans in this last episode. It's super cute. Um, so check it out. So Jordan, what news and events do we have going on? Well, on August 8th in Sweden, open rescue of two pigs happened by direct shafting group MD Cages. Also, the charges for the chalking activists got dropped. Thankfully. The Idaho ag gag law was overturned. But unfortunately, that only affects Idaho's law. Utah, you're next. Yep. Also, um... If you haven't heard about Sea Shepherd, Feral Island campaign, Stand Up 250, you should check that out. Um, some activists were arrested and charged there trying to help pilot whales. And also, Joseph and Nicole still need your help. So go to supportnicoleandjoseph.com and donate to their legal fund. For the slingshot this week, doing this one just for you, Jordan. On your birthday... In 1965, that's August 11th, if you guys don't know. That's when the Watts Rebellion began in Los Angeles. Damn right, they did it for my birthday. So happy birthday. They, they knew the future was happening, yeah, right? Yeah, no, obviously. Obviously. I mean, how, why else would they do it? That's also why the tornado happened on my birthday. That's a very inside, localized thing that no one's going to understand what you're talking about. There's only been like one tornado ever in Utah that <laughs> happened on my birthday and it ruined it. You're still pissed at that tornado. I am. That was my birthday. <laughs> well, happy birthday. Thanks. If you like these little tidbits of history, you pull them out of the Slingshot personal organizer, go pick one up yourself at a local info shop. Or if you don't have a local info shop, at an online info shop like AK Press. They're pretty nifty and dandy. I love mine. It's purple. Mine's blue. I sincerely hope you enjoy this episode. How's your day going? Not too bad. Are the levels okay on my end for you? Yeah, yeah, we're all good. Seems like it's good. Okay, cool. I'm just I'm using the good old iPhone earbud mic, so I never know if I'm like super loud or quiet or whatever. I'm surprised at how well that does most of the time. Yeah, it, we actually have quite a few guests. That's how they do it, and it works really well. But I can always change anything in post before you know. I was saying to a friend earlier that I kind of hope that it was not like a a live thing because you never know. There's usually little bits and pieces that get flubbed, so having some editing is is usually a good thing. Yeah, so you can yeah. say whatever you want and then be like, "Oh <laughs> shit, maybe I don't want to say that." <laughs> oh, I was actually that's one thing I was going to ask. I was going to ask what's the uh, the la the language curse away limited. 
Okay, cool. I'm I'm usually not like Trailer Park Boys kind of person. I don't know if I'm Canadian defying myself by that <laughs> reference, but um, you know, just something might slip, and I didn't want to didn't want to have you guys rushing for the uh, the beep or anything. Oh no, no, no curse all. away. We okay, just cool. we, just nothing hateful, please. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah no, problem. no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. I would just noticed on your website that you guys gave a grant out to the Food Empowerment Project. Yep. I, one, I want to say I absolutely love the Food Empowerment Project. They're probably my one of my favorite organizations right now. Um, but how did you start the whole grant program? Um, I mean, basically, well, actually, I guess first off, I'll I'll sort of just mention that there there isn't really a we. It's it's just me. <laughs> yeah. um, I, no, I, I just, I kind of, I used to do like the sort of royal we as in like the queen and everything for several issues. And then a few issues ago, I kind of just dropped it. And I've had to catch myself every now and then trying to make that reference because it's kind of fun every now and then to get people being like, oh, can I speak to the publicity department or the marketing department? <laughs> and then I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, that's me. I'm currently in my pajamas sitting in the living room with a cat and a dog. <laughs> there you go. I don't need to forward you to anyone. Um, but, but yeah, so the kind of, I guess that kind of gets into the grant thing. Um, the first few issues back in like 2007 to maybe 2009 or so, again, with the fact that like it, w- it was just a small team back then. Um, so the release schedule was kind of, kind of a a lax a little bit um so we printed the first three um which had a pretty high cost involved and i mean they did sell out over time but still there wasn't really a lot of money to kind of go around after that um so then in issue four i made the move to go digital and when i went digital only all of a sudden that meant that the little bit of money i had from advertising wasn't going towards print costs so because I'm a terrible capitalist, instead of just saying, oh, hey, I'll just pocket that and, you know, pay my rent and groceries and everything, uh, <laughs> I just decided to start giving half of the ad money to somebody or some group um, a few times. Well, actually, say in cases of food empowerment, I mean, you know, Lauren obviously is like the founder and everything, but I mean... Mm-hmm. I guess you can't say that it's just her because there are totally a bunch of volunteers and stuff that do a lot of work. So, yeah, the grant's been going on now for since issue four. Um, And then this one that I just gave out was the sixth one. So um, it's not I mean, it's it's nowhere near going to change the lives of anyone um, (laughs) in terms of like the the size of the grant. But uh I mean, usually with the people that are chosen and the organizations, it's kind of, it's the kind of thing that I know they're going to be able to stretch it to the last penny and it'll do some good. So, I mean, yeah, like you were saying, when it came time to choose for this one, uh, the Food Empowerment Project had been on my radar for a while, but um, I came, I ended up meeting Lauren at the uh, Resistance Ecology Conference in Portland just mm-hmm. a couple months ago. I just happened, I had done the uh, wild tofu tour down through the States and I just happened to end up in Portland at the same time as the conference. So I managed to table there and then that meant that I also was going to, I mean the conference is free anyway, but it, you know, it gave me the chance to go to some of the talks and so I definitely made an effort to see her and um, so that just kind of solidified it when I was like, oh, maybe I should choose food empowerment or something else and then I saw her talk and everything, I was like, yeah, come on, like they're all volunteer nonprofit and doing amazing work spreading, you know, a vegan message, but also pushing so much more beyond that, which is a big thing that like tofu has been kind of pushing itself. So anytime I can help support someone or an organization that's kind of saying, Hey, there's way more beyond just slapping a cruelty free label on something. I'm, I'm pretty much game. And luckily because of the switch to digital, um, I've been able to put some money there as well instead of just some retweets and Facebook shares because I think we all know those aren't really worth that much and <laughs> they're they're being worth less and less every day as Facebook starts tweaking things. Uh, that's super awesome though. I think that I mean we talked about it a little bit on Instagram but Food Empowerment Project is 
is awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, I um, I actually didn't know the depth of what they were doing. Like, I uh, I had heard about them through um, well, Doctor uh, Amy Breeze Harper. Had, she's mentioned them a few times, and I've seen them involved with some of the conferences that she's done. And uh, I mean, I've been a big supporter of hers from. I don't know, but maybe issue four or five was when uh, the grant was given to her and we had an interview with her and that issue and everything. And so at some point she put it into my head and I started knowing that name. And then it wasn't until the conference that I realized that there's so much more that they do beyond just say that, you know, the, the chocolate list, mm-hmm. which was, that was sort of my my foot in the door in terms of being like, oh, these people are doing cool things because I mean, so many people don't think about you know it's chocolate it's a delicious lovely thing why would there be a dark side to it but i mean really if you dig underneath pretty much anything in this day and age especially if it's tasty and you like it there's usually you know some blood sweat and tears on the other end that really isn't so great so i mean outside of that like they've been you know pushing a lot of stuff about like immigrant farm workers rights and doing school supply, like, not fundraising things, but just drives to, you know, get people to donate those sorts of things so that kids who are in, say, a family that has farm workers and everything have school supplies, which, you know, is sort of a branch of all this stuff about, like, fairing that the chances are the people that are working to pick the ingredients are not getting paid a hell of a lot. And then that, you know, that bleeds into the family's conditions and everything else. And then it all just snowballs because obviously, I mean, it's been proven time and time again how important education is. And if people don't have access to education or the supplies to be able to even, you know, learn to write and read and everything, then like, how is anyone going to get out of that cycle? Yeah, I, I, just love the intersectionality like you're talking about what they're working on. Yeah, I know I'm, I'm, I've been totally in love with their work. I didn't know much about their work till we had her on the show. And it's it, they seem to focus just on the er- everything that I give a shit about. And they're like <laughs> one of the few organizations that I can say like, yes, you know, I know if you give to them, that money's actually going to go to something good. Yep. Yeah. yeah and I mean, it's funny because I, I sent them like one of the best parts of any issue is when I get to send that email out to someone and say, Hey, uh, you're the recipient of the grant. And I mean, it's not like, it's not an application process. It's not this voting thing or anything like that. Like I've debated opening it up to that, but I, right now I'm still, it's just always fun to send out that email. And I usually get a really great reaction and people are like, Holy crap, thank you. And et cetera. And, I mean, in, in Lauren's case, she's been like super appreciative of it. And, you know, we wrote each other several times just back and forth to kind of organize like the posts that I did on the website and a few other things. And just every time she's like continued to thank me for it and everything. And, you know, I mean, to me, I was just like, well, it's not even that much money and everything. And like, you're the one doing all this amazing work. And, um, but she was like, even just, in the way that she's so adamant towards having people disclose like where, you know, where the cocoa comes from and everything mm-hmm. else and all about like just transparency. She was even like upfront with me about the fact that like she takes a bit of money to, you know, do things like pay her rent and stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> I would hope you do. <laughs> like, I'm okay with that. That's perfectly fine. You're working your butt off to try and make the world a better place. And like we all need to avoid burnout and should not feel guilty in any way for trying to make it so that you can do this sort of thing and still have a roof over your head and food on your plate. I mean, you know, she's, she's a long way from becoming say like Donald Trump. She's not, you know, like, I don't think the next thing you know, she's going to be dropping the, the money I gave her on like one plate at some fancy restaurant and just being like, meh, whatever. (laughs) <laughs> like that money's going to go do a lot of good. And if that just means her not having to worry about rent for, well, it's not even going to pay her rent for a month, I would assume. But if it pays a couple bills, that's perfectly fine. So it's just, you know, just to be able to have someone that's willing to have that much transparency, like is great. 
because I mean, the world needs more of it. And listening to her talk, she's definitely, uh, she, she's got a fire in her, which Mm -hmm. is also great to see. Like, I mean, just knowing people that are willing to kind of joke about things, but also are super serious about it as well. So like she knows, you know, she's the one making people uncomfortable, including vegans that are like, oh, well, everything I eat is cruelty free and everything. And she's like, well, where's your chocolate come from? And she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm the asshole that's ruining everyone's fun <laughs> at the party. I mean, because, you know, the Risk Resistance Ecology Conference, like it's an amazing conference and they're super involved in intersectionality and everything. I mean, the whole thing is free. There's amazing speakers from all different walks of life. And Lauren's the one saying, so how come you're, uh, you're offering donuts with chocolate? There's the chocolate fair trade and rainforest alliance and da 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 and all these other important things. She's like, where's it come from? And they're just like, oh shit, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm super <laughs> bummed we missed the, the resistance ecology this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I, I mean, I, I don't even think it was on my radar. Like I, and I wish it was because I mean, it's a great conference. And like, mm-hmm. I went from, I mean, in all honesty, like I haven't done a lot of the conferences, like the, uh, the Vita Vegan Conference, I got invited to uh, for the first two years while I was in Portland. And then uh, I went down to the one in Austin. And it was mainly like a food blogging conference in the beginning. But then they became a lot more open to like social justice stuff and just like the intersectionality of veganism. And like, you know, the last or this past year, they had um, like topics on eating disorders and veganism and failing health and veganism and body image and. But alongside that, there's, you know, how to uh, how to get a cookbook deal and how to podcast and everything else. So, I mean, to go from that sort of environment, that was, I mean, it was great. And I love the women that organized it. And unfortunately, it was the last one. But to go from that to a much more sort of, I mean, you know, they're super grassroots. It's just the three of them that did it. But it's a little shinier, I guess. Mm-hmm. So to go from that to like the resistance ecology one where you've got people like, you know, I was tabling and I'm selling like these aprons that are fair trade and organic, but I was selling them for like 30 bucks. And then next to me, there's this girl with like the faded denim jacket and a bunch of patches that are like free. If you just, you know, let her pet your cat when she's in town and sleeps on your couch or something. So I was just like, man, there's so many like, you know, I like in a way I felt out of place, but then in another way I was like, it's just awesome that there's so many different levels of people doing all these different things. <laughs> and no matter at what point you are, someone can call you out on your shit. But Lauren's the kind of person that she's not being a complete asshole about it. Like she's not the one that's calling you out because you're eating a donut instead of, you know, kale. She's just saying, hey, I know you're trying to be super awesome, but just so you know, those donuts were, you know, made on the backs and the blood of people in different parts of Africa or whatever. And it's cool that someone donated them as a sponsor, but come on, you can do better. And she comes across so sweet. We've we've focused this almost 15 minutes just talking about how awesome she is. It's crazy. (laughs) I think, have, have we hit 15 minutes yet or... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, about. pretty close to that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but you've brought up a bunch of stuff that I've actually I wanted to talk to you about, and one of them is like you do this completely by yourself, and like we do this by ourselves, and we really put ourselves out there. But I have an amazingly hard time like with self promotion, like mm-hmm. actually throwing myself out there, and you know, like we get the thousands of, of listeners every single month, and and that's all fine, but. I have a hard time like pushing it to try to grow up more. Like, how do you do that yourself? <laughs> um, in a day like today, I'm wondering if I even do do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, like I, uh, well, I just, I just arrived in Portland and Oregon a few days ago to house sit for a, a friend's family. And so when I finished the tour that I did, um, the, the aprons that I mentioned, actually, I left them here because I didn't want to go over the border with a bunch of aprons. Um, 
because I just figured I'd be asked a bunch of questions and then customs would probably charge me something for importing goods. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had already had like a miserable time getting into the States, uh, on the other end of the country. So because I was here, I was like, okay, fine. I'm just going to try and get rid of a bunch of the aprons. So I'll just put them on sale. And so today, like I got up in the morning, I had all the graphics made for like Facebook and Instagram and da, 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 da. And I posted all and I haven't sold an apron. I barely got any likes and it even involves like the cute, a cute dog. Like <laughs> how can you put something on the internet with a cute animal and not, you know, end up, what have I got to do? Have it be like a top 10 list? Is that the only, <laughs> the only way? Um, but I mean, yeah, like it's, it's a tough battle. I, uh, I actually felt a little better when I went to this conference down in Austin because a lot of people were cursing out Facebook and mm -hmm. saying that, you know, they've seen their, their reach just drop astronomically in the past say six months to a year. And I, um, uh, before last September, I was actually like a copywriter for a web and marketing company. So as much as, as much as I hated marketing and all of that, I actually was pretty good at it. Um, and like I ran some social media for some clients and did taglines and ad copy and all that stuff. And, uh, that was like four years of my life and I worked with another agency before that. And so it's sort of been something that I dabbled in, but it, like last September when I quit my job and decided to just finally push tofu full time, um, that was when I started feeling okay to be doing this sort of stuff. Um, Unfortunately, it seems like Facebook has been tweaking things ever since then, and it's just been like going downhill more and more. Um, and you know, Twitter's on the way to it, and a lot of people love Instagram. But as of like a couple days ago, they're opening up uh, to make advertising a lot easier. So you're going to see a lot of more of that stuff, and then people are probably going to start moving away from that platform because I don't want to see a McDonald's ad in the middle of my Instagram feed of what everybody's eating while I'm hungry. Like that's not what I want to see. And that's what was great about Instagram, but that's going to start happening. Cause you know, people got to make money and yeah, I mean for me in terms of like doing the promotions and stuff, I guess I, I don't feel super bad about it because I kind of like to think that, you know, it's, it's for like a greater good or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, not to belittle the greater good. I just don't kind of like that term per se. <laughs> um, yeah, whatever. Changing the world, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's, it's not, it's not that like, it's not that I want to say that's not important. It's just, I, I don't know. I, I have issues with people sometimes. Like if I see be the change you want to see in the world on, on someone's beach picture on Facebook again, I'm, I don't know maybe I'll quit Facebook, but it's just, there's a, <laughs> there's plenty of other ways to, to say things, I guess. And so I think maybe I don't quite feel I've figured out how to catch everyone's attention. So like to have somebody say to me, Oh, Hey, how do you, how is it that you're so effective on social media and everything? I'm, I guess maybe I'm not sure because I don't feel like I am like in the same way that like when I've been on panels and stuff at conferences and people are like, Oh, what's your secret? Like how did tofu get where it is and everything. And to me, it's just what I've been doing. Like I just decided to start a magazine and I just kept putting it out and luckily some people liked it and the magazines disappeared and I don't have boxes of them. But I mean, right now I got a box of aprons that no one seems to be buying. So you know, it's, it's like, I, I guess like, I don't feel like it's as easy as I think other people have it, but I'm also kind of aware of the fact that no one actually has it that easy. Like everyone has their own kind of obstacles and they all go and post on social media and they end up being like, why is this not working? Like, why am I talking to crickets? Cause actually Lauren even said that in an email to me this morning, cause she posted through social media about how they got the grant and everything. And, you know, I said, Oh yeah, that's cool. Like, and I'll post about it later and everything. And she was like, yeah, cause lately I feel like we're just talking to crickets. Mm -hmm. And so it's funny because 
you know, like I'm, I'm guessing maybe that's how you found out about it because like, I haven't really posted about it. And, you know, so there are people that see it, but maybe because it's such a weird medium where like, if you don't get that feedback from people, you just kind of feel like you're putting it out there and it's just going out to nobody. Whereas if you're having that immediate conversation with someone face to face, at least say 10 years ago, it felt like they were listening. Now it just looks like they're sitting there on Instagram while you're talking to them, <laughs> which is funny. Cause you know, apparently I feel like no one's listening to you on social media either. So I, um, I actually read this great interview with, uh, Ian McKay earlier today. And I mean, you know, the guy always has a million things to say, but he just had this in sort of his typical sort of old punk guy, crusty fashion. He was sort of like, not anti-social media, but he was kind of just like, what is the big deal? Like, why is everyone so into this? And, you know, I'd much rather have that person to person interaction and like step outside of it and get out there in the real world. And he was also talking about how people are like, oh, well, what about your legacy? And like, you know, all the bands that you did and how you changed things and everything. He's like, I never set out to do that. Like, I don't see myself as doing that. Like, I just get up in the morning and this is the day that I'm living. And you know, tomorrow is going to be another day and I'm going to do different things and whether or not people like those different things, fuck them. Like he just wants to put out an album, you know? So yeah, I just yeah. decided to put out a magazine and as much as, you know, I am kind of obsessed with like, I would like to see a hundred likes and have people share it and everything on another end. I guess I've kind of realized that it's not going to stop me from doing it because <laughs> I probably should have stopped years ago. <laughs> But, you know, like in the same way with you guys, right? Like you're not making millions of dollars off of this podcast, but you still do it for no, some reason. No, we are. We're making. I mean, oh, okay. Just, just well, shy. I mean, we're just shy of it. Yeah. <laughs> so in obviously, debt. should I give you my address for the check in the mail or? <laughs> I mean, no, wait, I don't need money. I'm not doing it for the money. I don't need to pay rent or buy food. <laughs> no, it, it's crazy because you're right. It's so weird of what people pick up on social media too. Like we'll do all these posts and try to have all this interaction and then the random weird post all of a sudden gets huge traction. Everyone, you're like, really that one? Like, <laughs> Yeah, I think like I posted about like medical care for a, a prisoner and that just blew up, which mm -hmm. is great. I totally want people to focus on that. Um but it's just weird to see which posts blow up compared to mm -hmm. the others. Yep. Oh yeah. I, um, <laughs> I actually ended up in, and it actually, I'll, <laughs> I'll talk about the Ian McKay interview again in a second. Cause he had another great quote that kind of reminded me of this incident. I, um, I've posted about like the Hampton Creek, just Mayo and like the lawsuits and da 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 da. And recently, you know, they got seven 11 to, to switch to their, mm -hmm. their vegan Mayo. And, Hold on, so wait. I, well, I didn't know you that. You didn't know that? No. no. All 7-Eleven stores now use yeah. just mayo instead of So mayo. you're going to say I actually have to go to a fucking 7-Eleven now? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, you still probably wouldn't be able to order the sandwich or anything that they yeah. put it. <laughs> oh, but. yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and see, I mean, th like this was the kind of thing, like I was sort of hoping to have this kind of discussion about, you know, well, more for me, it was the fact that Hampton Creek is very adamant about not advertising towards the vegan community yeah yeah like, that's not their market their market is mainstream people and i feel like it's only in the past little while that that sort of thing has become a strategy which from a marketing standpoint actually seems kind of smart because i mean as much as i feel there is a strength to the vegan label and it should be used in some ways it also sort of kills itself because the minute you say, oh, this, you know, this sandwich is vegan or this mayo is vegan, those people that were brought up on Hellman's are going, oh, well, ugh, no, I don't want that. That tastes weird. But if you can get it in their hands through like the largest convenience store chain in, you know, North America or whatever, then maybe they're going to be willing to try more things. Mm -hmm. So I post, I had posted about the lawsuit before and it blew up like, you know, just easily one of the biggest posts of the week or the month or whatever. So I followed it up a couple of weeks ago with this one about 7-Eleven. And my, my question really was where, like, is there a strength to having this change happen if it isn't prefaced with the fact that it's vegan? 
So if you're not promoting this as a vegan product, but yet it's getting out there to more people. And so now obviously a vegan mayo is being used, which you can't say isn't helping animals. Because yeah, I mean, yeah, now there's eggs. a massive quantity of mayo from, I don't know, I assume Hellman's or some cheap knockoff that just lost a contract to 7-Eleven, which is a large sum of money. So that trickles down to a large sum of eggs, I would assume, that are not being ordered from different suppliers. Mm -hmm. So the animals are better off, but does this change anything in the vegan movement if just Mayo isn't saying that it's a vegan product and 7-Eleven is now carrying a vegan product? So I posted that, and all I ended up with was people giving me shit because the magazine's supposed to be, you know, about intersectionality and everything, and the vegan movement isn't going to get any better if all we do is talk about food. <laughs> and so I got in this big debate with this person, and I was like, look, have you looked at the past posts I did about, say, you know, 100 black uh, vegan bloggers that people should know, which went nowhere. Like, it, I mean, it, it did okay, but, like, it didn't get that much attention. I was like, uh... That's the, the one Sister Vegan did, right? Yeah, I, yeah, actually, no, I don't think I don't think it was her. I think it was someone on Tumblr. Yeah, I really they, liked it. I saw it. I saw it, but I thought I saw it posted by Sister Vegan. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it might like it did get some shares and everything, right? And rightfully so. And like that's the kind of thing that I would love to see people talk about. Mm -hmm. But because of the way Facebook works, and because of the fact that really the majority of people just want to talk about happy, fluffy stuff. I mean, chances are they're on Facebook in the middle of the day because they're at work and they want a distraction. So instead of, you know, reposting this awesome list of people that should be represented in the vegan community and talked about and reblogged and everything, people were attracted to this 7-Eleven Mayo thing. <laughs> and those people, all those people that liked it and shared it and everything, probably didn't even notice my question. They probably mm -hmm. just saw the headline that said 7-Eleven switches to vegan mayo. And they're like, oh, that's awesome. So then I got in this whole discussion with these people who were calling me out for basically like just watering down the vegan movement and talking about food. And I just started listing off all these past posts in like the past week or so. And I was like, where were you during all of these things? Why weren't you sharing these things? Why weren't you engaging in them? And oh, by the way, while you're engaging with me on this, you're only pushing it farther thanks to Facebook, which oh, by the way, is a total capitalist system that's built on ad revenue. Because somewhere down the line during the conversation, they got into it with me about how veganism has become nothing but a marketing scheme and capitalism is capitalism is capitalism and everything. And then eventually it turned into why is this suddenly about you? So I was being called out for like derailing my own conversation. Why, why was it about you? Come on. <laughs> because it was my magazine. <laughs> <laughs> like I posted the conversation to start talking about whether or not the vegan label should be used. And somehow it turned into, well, we're not going to change the movement if all we do is talk about food. But at the end of the day, I can post, you know, a picture of tacos on Instagram and get, say, 60 likes. Whereas if I go post a picture of this book I'm reading about feminism and liberation, I get eight likes. I can't help that. It's because like, vegans are always hungry. <laughs> exactly. I mean, people bond over food. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, underlying that is the fact that this food has no animal ingredients. Mm -hmm. So the animals benefit from it. But I mean, you know, like the, the magazine, we have recipes in it. See, I just used the we and it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I have recipes in the magazine. But I mean, it's like maybe, you know, six or four to six pages out of like 80. Mm -hmm. And I purposely do that. Like I put them in there because people like them. And if people submit it, I want to be able to use it. But for the most part, you know, the the issues talk about deeper, you know, meatier things. And the, the fact of the matter is, when I posted on Facebook that I had a new issue out, that got like an eighth of the attention that this Just Mayo switch at 7-Eleven did. And, I mean, I had to pay for that. Like, I had to pay Facebook to promote it, and it still didn't get nearly as much attention. And that's all based on whether or not people engage in it. And I can't change that part. Like, I mean, in theory, the people that like the Facebook page like the magazine. So I would hope that they'd be excited when there's a new issue out. But they seem to be more excited about, you know, oh, the other big one I had was this BuzzFeed article about 
dogs that looked really big in photos because they were like, you know, they were in the foreground and people were in the background and stuff. So that one blew up. People loved it. That had nothing to do with veganism. It was just cute puppies. When doing graphic design work for Beagle Freedom Project and them posting on their social media, I know that the bigger the dog's face is on the post, the more likes it gets. Yeah. And so that probably, you know, that makes sense. They're big in the photo. So I, I think in general, I I mean, I've joked about it before, and that I need to just do an issue that's just cats and then an issue that's just dogs. I'm not even going to talk about sexism and veganism or body image or anything. It's just going to be cats. <laughs> and and there might not even be vegan cats. They might just be cats. Then you're tapping and... into, like, <laughs> more than 2% of the market. See? <laughs> It's true. Yeah, you you get like cat people and dog people and you're like in the the 70-80%. I should just take on cat fancy and my, my issues of not making money will be all solved. <laughs> <laughs> and then when people do call me out for watering down the vegan movement, I'll be like, "Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Move on." I just wanted to sell magazines. <laughs> Oh, we should do the same. But but go <laughs> going back to your post about the actual question, like I remember when Tofuti first came out with cheese and it wasn't vegan. And I was blown away. I'm like, but you're a vegan company. And they're like, No, we're not. No, we're not. We're not a vegan company. <laughs> I'm like, Oh. Like that was what, ninety nine ish, I think when that happened. Um Yeah. So it's so, products with cheese in it, right? Or no, no. They they're it? they're their tofuti sliced cheeses weren't vegan. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And um and there was like a huge boycott on all tofuti products. I'm like, but their ice yep. cream's good. But um <laughs> but I know um Beyond Meat does the same thing where they don't try yep. to advertise to vegans at all. Yeah, I mean I um well, like up in Canada I haven't seen it that much, but I mean it was only a couple days ago when I arrived here that like I was reading their packaging and everything, and that's all it talks about is just meat. Yeah how it's like a healthier version and da da da. And I mean that like, you know, again, that is sort of the debate. Right. And I like, I personally love the fact that we're even at the point where we can have such a debate because people have these new strategies that, cause I mean, as much as like, as much as yes, you, it wants to be like veganism should be sold on say the ethical basis because I mean, obviously, there's so many issues if you just sell it on health or if you go the route of, say, certain organizations and sell it on sex and whatever, it it doesn't last as long because people realize that, you know, you can eat ice cream and cheese and pizzas and everything and still have a terrible diet and end up, you know, completely unhealthy as a vegan. But if the ethics are involved, it's like, okay, you're still saving animals, mm -hmm. but yeah, and I think maybe that's why people get so upset when there's this company that they've been supporting suddenly turns around and they're like, oh, well, actually, like, we never said we were a vegan company. We just happened to make a vegan product. Like, as far as I know, Daya or Daya, whatever the current <laughs> today's pronunciation of it is, <laughs> um, as far as I know, like, they never set out to do a vegan cheese. They just wanted to do one that involved less allergens. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, dairy and soy and nuts and whatever. And that's what they did. And then it just kind of blew up at, you know, like the the food expos and stuff that they were going to because people are just like, oh, my God, it melts. That's amazing. <laughs> and I mean, now, obviously, they're all over the place. But I think I'm pretty sure they've maintained like all vegan products. But I feel like maybe their cheese has shown up in some places and people have been like, what? It's not a vegan restaurant or whatever. Like, why are they dealing with them? And you know, again, at the end of the day, I don't know. I mean, I guess we could get into the whole argument about small steps versus mm -hmm. the complete demolition of the whole system. And until that happens, we'll never be happy sort of thing, which, I mean, is a whole other argument I've got into on, you know, on Facebook and stuff. And I mean, I don't think that'll ever be answered. But um, yeah, like there's just there's so many companies out there that and I mean, maybe to me, that's kind of a positive is that they're not even coming at it from the vegan side. They're like, they see a value in going that route. And so they're putting it out there. And I mean, since it is food, 
if that means that more people are buying it simply because you know it's it's cost effective for their family and it's tasty and it's at every grocery store that you can think of then i don't really see how that's super negative because i mean like we said like it's less animals being consumed you know and, I, yep i've always going to say I've, I've always felt there's only going to be a certain segment of the population that we're going to convince to change through education mm-hmm. and that segment's going to be relatively minute like the rest of the people are going to change because their choices are just changed in front of them. You know, whether that's for for economic reasons, for taste reasons, Mm -hmm. for whatever reasons, you know, the majority of people aren't going to change because they made this high ground choice of, I don't want to hurt animals. It's just, Oh, this is what I can afford. Or, you know, these are the products are available to me. Yeah. I mean, like this Seven Eleven switch wasn't by popular demand. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a, you know, a customer poll. It's chances are it's just that Jess Mayo was able to offer Seven Eleven a better bottom line. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they said we'll do that, and now that means everyone that's going into Seven Eleven, whether or not it's because you know they just want to buy a big meatball sub and a liter of cola, or because maybe they live in a community that has completely shitty food options, and Seven Eleven's one of the only places they can go to, they're now using vegan mayo, which is. I don't know. I consider that a pretty great thing, but I I don't know what my readers think because I never got into the conversation. (laughs) (laughs) All I know is now I can go in there and buy some corn chips and get some mayo and have like a really disgusting mayo dip. (laughs) Because I mean, like 7-Elevens had vegan options before, right? Like they, yeah, they, you know, people have talked about it, whether or not it was like, oh, here's these accidental things. But I think 7-Elevens kind of, openly said like hey we do have vegan options like i think i found i was in la once on on like the end of a tour and i think we ended up finding brownies or something it just happened to be vegan yeah Mm -hmm. i think they have a few pastries sometimes that are vegan because most their pastries are sourced locally so if you can get a local really yeah if you can get a local place to do their pastries that will offer vegan options for a long time here there they all their donuts were sourced from a company here that made vegan donuts so for about two years, all the Seven Elevens had vegan donuts here. What? Why yeah. Did, why yeah. didn't I know about this? Um, Seriously, you were like in <laughs> elementary school, I think, at the time. So. <laughs> Still, <laughs> but um, yeah, and it was a. Uh, but that unfortunately, that bakery is no longer around, and that bakery only made vegan donuts because another activist here just went there and be like, "If you change this one ingredient, they're vegan." They're like, "Really? Cool. We'll do that." Yeah. I mean that. Oh, how many times have I like? gone to a grocery store and you know just picked up a loaf of bread or something and i'm like really did you need the egg whites for for glaze yeah did, did you really mm-hmm. you, you didn't even need it like look it's the second last ingredient i know that means that it's practically useless why why did you have to put that in there now i'm not gonna buy it but yeah it's funny because i know um at least uh some good friends of mine that run the uh, the gay vegans blog um, like there's a place in Denver that they, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, that they used to go to a fair bit and they said to them like, look, if you just make these few changes, you know, cause it was like a Mexican place, like a traditional in some section of Mexico. And, um, so I mean, the menu was fairly adaptable to begin with and, you know, he just kind of worked with them and said, look, like if you just make these few changes or even better, like if you actually identified vegan options on your menu i would totally promote this and like have the vegan community in denver come here and i've been there two or three times now like it's one of my favorite spots to go in denver and the last time i went like they had just reprinted these new menus and they had all these like the vegan section was there and everything was marked as like vegetarian or vegan option if you ask and everything and i mean the food's phenomenal and they didn't really make much of a change and it's the same, you know, like even just if you were like, oh, well, hey, if you just brought in some day of cheese, which is now available in like big commercial bags and mm-hmm. whatever, then look like your your pizza crust is already vegan. So all you got to do is offer that one option, charge a couple dollars extra, and I'll get a bunch of my friends to come down. And suddenly there's this whole other market that opens up. And, you know, I mean, obviously, then again, there's the debate and, well, like, do you want to support a company that also sells animal products and et cetera, et cetera. But I kind of feel like because of all these different strategies, we're better off now than we were 30 years ago. I mean, 
would you have expected a vegan mayo and you know in Seven Eleven? Would you have even no. expect a vegan mayo? That like tasted good, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right? Like one that's actually <laughs> had Hellman bothered enough <laughs> that they took a lawsuit against them on such a petty thing to say like it's not actually mayo because it's not made out of egg. Yeah, like mm-hmm. I mean, so many vegan products are just under the radar because I mean their market share is squat all, but now they're becoming bigger and companies are going well this isn't cool like they can't say their cheese or they can't say their milk like um in canada field roast ended up in hot water they were selling uh, in places for a while and then i'm not sure if it's because a company reported them or not but there were the the food regulations um involved the fact that because they were suggesting they were like a meat alternative they had to be able to prove that you know their protein content was similar to meat and they thought that meant that they would have to test on animals to like be able to do the comparisons. So, so they backed out of the country. They were just like, we're not, you know, we're not killing animals to prove that our, our uh, field roast sausages are just as good protein wise. Um, so they ended up with a lot of back and forth with the government and regulations and everything. And I guess they kind of figured it out, but they actually had to change like the content of their product. So in Canada, like the packaging is different. And not just because there's French on it, but like it's actually different packaging and the ingredients are slightly different. And so now, I don't know if they actually call themselves like a sausage or if it's some sort of meat-based alternative or whatever. But like the fact that we have these lobbyists and these major companies that rake in like billions of dollars scared enough that they're attacking it based on like a definition is, I think it's a good sign. Mm Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, obviously we're hurting them in the pocketbook, which really in the system we're in is one of the only ways to make a lot of change. You know, they definitely can't compete. Like when when something has eggs in it and, you know, and your product doesn't, there's definitely a cost difference there. Oh, yeah. And so they yeah, can't compete. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, because of the fact that, you know, like even just on the cholesterol train, like you can sell no cholesterol to so many people now because of the way our diet has gone for like decades. And I mean, you know, okay, it kind of gets into the health thing, but at least like, I feel, I don't know. I mean, I feel like that's an easier thing towards restaurants and stuff. So that say like, I mean, maybe down the road, Subway will switch their mayo out. I mean, I've, I think, there, at least there's been a push to try and get tofurkey slices in Subway. I don't know if anywhere has actually done it. I've brought my own in. <laughs> <laughs> nice. They've, they're they coming out with um, three different vegan options um, in a lot of markets. I know they've been piloting them. Yeah. So there's okay. that. They probably will make their own or outsource like they did with the Morningstar veggie patties that aren't vegan. Yeah. Because, I mean, I kind of feel... Like some of those people that get on the whole bandwagon of saying like, oh, well, you shouldn't be supporting these companies because they sell meat products and everything. I kind of feel like maybe some of those people are like they just live in big cities where they can go to the vegan grocery store and go to the vegan, you know, restaurant and whatever. And to me, I'm like, I mean, I, you know, I've I've lived in like several different places in the world and 7-Eleven is one of the cornerstones. Like it's the first thing you can recognize in a city. I mean, I saw them in South Korea. I, saw them in Thailand, like they're all over the place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if that sort of company picked up, you know, had vegan options and stuff, I mean, even Starbucks say like, I think there's a few things that they offer. So knowing that if you're traveling and if you're in some part of the world where you know there's going to be a Starbucks because they're everywhere, there's something that you can eat, which is a great thing. And it, you know, it also helps if you're traveling with other people, you can be like, look, this whole vegan thing really isn't that difficult. I can, you know, I can plot myself down in some country in Asia in like a town and walk into a 7-Eleven and get something to eat just like you can, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I know when I was in, in South America and I went to a Starbucks because it was the only thing I could recognize, they didn't have <laughs> soy milk. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. The, um, I think the Tim Hortons, which is like, I guess comparable to Dunkin' Donuts, um, they've they supposedly started offering soy milk, but I think the distribution of it across Canada is like just the complete shits. 
Like, I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure it's basically just Toronto and Vancouver. I was going to say, yeah. every time I've been, they don't have it. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, I know a bunch of people. Like, I follow, you know, the Veg group in Halifax. And, like, Newfoundland has one. And people seem to be like, yeah, so I asked for it. And they didn't have it. And I'm like, yeah, that's, you know. And, I mean, I like... Yeah, I guess it it all depends, right? Like it's all based on demand and the bottom line. And mm-hmm. if you've go, only got one store in, say, St. John's, Newfoundland, and you know 98% of your clientele are going to want the regular 2% milk, you're not going to spend your budget mm-hmm. on the other stuff. But, you know, I mean, obviously Tim Hortons saw a benefit overall to offer it. And so, I mean, hopefully it does build up from there and people going and asking for it helps. But, yeah, I don't know. I guess it's just, I, I think I kind of tend to look at it all as, like, it's just going to be sort of baby steps. But then, I mean, I guess I've been vegan for seven or eight years now. And when I think back to the way it was when I started, it's kind of like, I mean, vegan cheese didn't melt. <laughs> <laughs> it was just sort of, it was just sort of this stuff. And, I mean, now I can call up, probably a few different pizza delivery chains that are like national mm-hmm. and having vegan cheese on there is like an option that you click on an online menu and it'll show up at your door, which is pretty great. <laughs> I, w- I was trying to explain that to my daughter the other day. I'm like mm-hmm. you're eight and I can right now get four pizza places to deliver vegan cheese pizza to your door. That's, like that's insane. When I was, you know, when I first went vegan, there was none. There just didn't fucking exist. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yep. And the cheese that did exist was terrible. Yeah, it's true. And I mean, now you've got like artisan cheeses that are like fifteen to twenty dollars, and you know, aged, smoked <clears throat> vegan cheese, which tastes amazing. <laughs> and, you know, you can have like wine and cheese parties that are completely vegan. Which doesn't involve just this terrible goop that you put together <laughs> with nutritional yeast and something or another. And you're like, no, it's it's like cheese. <laughs> and you got that one friend that's like, dude, you haven't had cheese in a long time. This is not cheese. I, I still, still like I those. still like the goop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was raised on the goop. I know. I me too. I'm like, that's all I had for so long. That's just what I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I recently saw a product that they take um they take like the root of a, a a legume kind of bean or something like that, and they they've actually been able to get like a blood type consistency. It tastes. Everyone says it tastes like blood, and they've been putting it in. Are you making like blood sausage and shit? No, no, they've been putting it in like burgers to give it more authentic, mm-hmm. like um, like, you know, yeah. When you, the, when you um, cook a burger, it bleeds. You know, that was my biggest complaint with the beast burgers, though, is that it tastes too much like a real burger. It's not for you then. Yeah, it's totally not for me. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, there's there's a few times like that moment's always interesting, isn't it? Like, especially if you're at a restaurant, because then you're just like, oh shit, they miss some, they mix, the they mix something up, and you're yeah. like, this this totally isn't vegan. Uh oh. Mm-hmm. And then they'll go and be like, no, no, it's it's such and such a thing, and you're like, oh. And I, I guess like I didn't. I didn't come into the whole vegan thing in the sense that like I found it disgusting to be eating meat. Um, so I've never been like super like I, you know, I have friends that just have a complete gut reaction to the concept of even like going near any of it. And I don't have that gut reaction. Like I, I'm vegan just because I, I don't think I could kill anything. Yeah. And if I can't do it, I don't want to benefit from the death of that animal so that's pretty much it um so i mean to me in some ways like i kind of do crave that similarity just because i spent years and years growing up with whatever it was right like say mac and cheese like Mm -hmm. the fact that i can now have a mac and cheese that you know gets kind of brown on the top in the oven and whatever like that's awesome and i mean my family for the most part is totally cool with having vegan mac and cheese now because they don't notice much difference in fact my sister prefers it compared to the other one um but yeah the uh the burger thing um funny enough the one of the artisan cheeses um miyoko she was 
at the conference in Texas, and I think they were having this, um, the conversation was just about, like, the new, uh, what was it, she had coined some term, like, the new vegan economy or something like that, um, and it was just this sort of a talk about, like, you know, the way that veganism was becoming a viable business model, um, and I mean, obviously, you know, she does, like, the artisan cheese thing, and she's done amazing with it, um, but she mentioned that, you know, there was this food tech company that was doing something so that, like, you could have a veggie burger that bled. And there was one panelist that was just completely disgusted with it. And I was like, no, that's, like, that's just terrible. And, I mean, like like you said, right? Like, well, that's just not for you. Yeah. Which is fine. And, I mean, on the other end, like, there's the whole conversation about test tube meat. Like, that's going to become a thing. Mm-hmm. Ten years down the road, we're going to have you know, this test tube meat option that is effectively meat, but didn't involve the death of anything. Mm-hmm. I'll totally try it. <laughs> and and I would too. Like, I don't know if I'd eat it all the time. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you know, obviously gets into the whole like, okay, it's not even like real, but I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not anti-science. So no. I, it's not like I totally distrust what science can do. But I'm sure that there's plenty of people that are like, no, no way. But, I mean, there's just so many points about the vegan philosophy and everything that 30 years ago, that wasn't even part of the debate. Yeah. <laughs> like, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't have been talking about, well, what about if it was grown in a test tube? I mean, you know, of course, we still have the whole, like, well, what if you were on a desert island? But... I mean, now we've got these new situations of, well, what if it was grown in a test tube and it was actual meat and had the same protein content and everything, but... It's a viable it question. <laughs> it'll, yeah, right? It'll just get to the point where we actually have an, the opportunity to have a preference. Like, yeah. we don't really have that now. We have cheeses, and we might like one cheese over the other, but, you know, we usually are like, okay, I'll eat it. But having a preference is like, oh, I don't really like that veggie burger. I don't really ever want to eat it. Yeah, well, no, it's, it's totally burger. true. Like, I open my fridge now, and I sometimes just get in awe. I'm like, this isn't just veggies anymore. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's mind-boggling. Yep. But um, you, you said you've been vegan for about seven or eight years now. Um, what What is your origin? Like, what brought you to veganism? Um, huh. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, first off, that, like, I, I don't actually know how long it's been. Um. I was quoting six or seven years a while ago, so I think it's been a year since that time. <laughs> um, I get that. Like, I, I don't have my vegan anniversary or whatever, because mm-hmm. yeah. it wasn't, it was just such a gradual thing. Like, I didn't, I mean, I guess, yeah, like, I know the moment when I was just like, no, I, I can't fuck around anymore. Like, I ate this big bag of Doritos chips, and I had been, like, a domestic vegan with a girl that I was living with, and... Um, I'm, I moved from Halifax to Winnipeg to look for work and she stayed in Halifax. And so I was kind of more vegetarian at the time. And then I ate this big bag of Doritos and I was just, I felt miserable. And I mean, part of it was probably just MSG, but either way, like we had started talking about putting out the magazine and everything. And I just said, like, I can't, I can't put my name behind this vegan magazine if I'm not talking the talk like that. I just you know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but I mean, before that, like it was just a gradual thing. Like I met her and she was vegan. And so I just kind of felt like it was respectful to her that if we were around each other, like I ate vegan as well. And I wasn't super adamant about like, no, I need meat. Like I'm going to just crumble if I don't get protein and whatever. Like it was something that I was open to because I had also been fairly involved in the music scene. So like that sort of political and like activism kind of side was already something that I was being exposed to. So veganism wasn't like this super foreign, what do you mean? You just eat plants. It was like, I knew of musicians and everything that were like that. So it all kind of came into play. And then, you know, we moved in together. And when I moved in, I brought in like a can of tuna and maybe a couple other things. And when that can of tuna went, then I didn't buy any more tuna. And you know, if we went out to a show and it was three o'clock in the morning and, you know, we were walking home and me and the guys in the band or whatever, were like, oh, we need to get pizza. Then I got the veggie slice of pizza. Um, 
but I mean, she did most of the cooking, so I ate mainly vegan then. And yeah, eventually we, uh, we did two cookbooks uh, in Halifax, just a small run to try and raise money for uh, an outdoor festival that I was doing. Uh, and they were both vegan because I had several people that were volunteering with me for the festival that were vegan. So I figured it just, it was an interesting thing to do. Uh, they went really well. Um, so then we just kind of were like, well, we might as well keep doing things. Uh, she did a dining guide to Halifax for vegans. And then when we started talking about what to do next, it's similar to what I was saying before, right? Like you just kind of keep doing things Mm -hmm. and it's not, you know, there wasn't like focus groups and these in-depth marketing strategies of like, well, what will work? It was just, well, we did a couple cookbooks. You did dining guides. So what can we do next? A a magazine seems kind of neat. And I can't remember if maybe at that time Herbivore had just stopped putting out a magazine. Um, But they were definitely still an influence. Like she was reading Herbivore magazine uh, during our relationship and everything. So I think it may have only been recently that they put out their last issue or whatever. Um, So we were just really influenced by them. And we just, it seemed like a logical thing to do. even though starting a magazine is just completely ridiculous. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, I think by then maybe we had at least learned not to do everything in Microsoft Word. So <laughs> that made it a little easier, and our print guy was a lot happier. Um, but yeah, so it all kind of just went hand in hand. Like There were just a bunch of different influences that kind of led to me going, you need to be vegan if you're going to keep doing the things you're doing. And you enjoy these things and you agree with the ideas of them. And then, yeah, I had, um, like growing up, I had gone on, you know, like rabbit hunting trips and moose hunting trips and everything. And I spent the whole time just being like, please don't get anything. Please don't get anything. And when I all kind of put that in my head and molded over, I was like, you don't like, you can't handle the idea of something dying. So why are you eating dead things? And, and that was sort of it. And all of a sudden now that's seven or eight years ago (laughs) it wasn't because of the cheese i think we established that i definitely wasn't won over by the cheese in the beginning i I don't think anyone's won over by maybe nowadays (laughs) i don't know but yeah yeah (laughs) but uh, how how can people follow your work you know get the magazine get your aprons uh i wish you still had the tote bags the i'm I'm vegan but not pita i love those things but i might uh, have one I absolutely love it. So if you if you're in a sharing mood, <laughs> if uh, yeah, if I find out, if I I had sort of asked, there was someone else that had kind of spoken for it, but I haven't heard from them in like a day or two. So I'll give another bit, and if I don't hear from them, I'll let you know. Okay, let me let me know because I love that bag. But yeah, how can people follow your work and, and get in contact with you and you know get the magazine? Uh oh God, I mean I could list off all the social media, but um just tofumagazine dot com. We'll put everyone on the website, and then it's all kind of, you know, if you search for the same name on Facebook or Twitter or Tumblr or Google Plus or I don't know. I haven't gone on Snapchat yet. I think I'm too old for that one. I still haven't <laughs> figured out how the kids use it. But, you know, I, I'm dabbling in Periscope, which has been interesting. Um, so, yeah, just Tofu Magazine for the most part. I uh, I've kind of... Tried to at least keep control of that one, and I, uh, I've only run into one issue so far with someone in, uh, I think, in Denmark that tried to use the same name, and I had to get a little, uh, a little mean, <laughs> but it worked out in the end. So yeah, Tofu Magazine. If you Google it, you should find it quick enough. Well, we end every episode saying "fuck shit, damn." Would you mind saying it for us this week? All right, I, I could do that. I, I probably won't recommend this to my parents, though. Just, <laughs> just so you know, that's two less two less listeners you're gonna have. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, fuck shit, damn. Awesome, thank you so much. <laughs> no problem, and thank you guys. Hey. Have a wonderful night. Okay, same to you. Okay, right, see ya. Bye, bye, bye. This week you heard eleven by Cormega. Right now you're listening to. The Renewal by Nodes of Ranveer. Wanted to give a quick shout out to Lisa D in New York City. Thank you so much for your kind words and your iTunes review. If 
you haven't already yet, please go review us on iTunes. It helps out the show tremendously. It's super simple to do. Most of you are already signed into iTunes. And if not, it's not that hard, especially for free content. So just go go do it. Give us a, a couple stars and write a nice little thing about us. If you already have done it, thank you so much. And grab someone else's device. Ask them if you can rate and view for them or have them do it. Hashtag ghost review. You know, or if you sit down to a public computer and somebody's iTunes that just happens to be signed on, oh, maybe write a review under that. And you can subscribe them at the same time. It's you know. free. Maybe they'll like it. It's a gift. If they don't like it, they can just unsubscribe. Yeah. I mean, seriously. But who wouldn't like this? It's wonderful. If you haven't yet already, be our friend on social media. We like to tweet. We like to Facebook. There's not a fancy word for Facebook. You know, I'm surprised at how much stuff I learn off of our own social media feeds. <laughs> we pretty much post on there every day. So be our friend. Like us. Follow us. Be one of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. What do we do now? Fuck shit, damn. Well, you already did it. Get out of my house. Which Side Podcast is hosted and produced by Jordan Halliday and Jeremy Parkin of the Which Side Media Collective. With web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Theme music by Commandantes. Go to wishsidecollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, fuck shit damn.